Uh, I am Kirk Presnicker. I am the Chief Architect, uh, a Fellow, and Vice President at Hewlett Packard Labs. Uh, I joined HP back in 1989, uh, fresh out of Santa Clara University, grew up uh, in the Silicon Valley, uh, and I've been here ever since. Um, had a variety of jobs, started off as member of technical staff. Um, I have been at the labs uh, since 2014. Uh, prior to that, um, my job was uh, in our business group, our computing business group. Uh, I was the chief technologist of servers, uh, which meant that if it had an HP logo on it and it computed everything above a laptop, uh, hardware, software, partnerships, uh, all that was my technical remit. And uh, I did that. I, that was a, the pinnacle of about 25 years of product development. And I didn't come to the labs um, in 2014 to make a late career pivot from uh, engineering and product development into research. I came to fill that hard, uh, complicated, and uncomfortable middle space between research and product development. You know, when I started in 18, 1989, it, I could come down to Palo Alto, come down to Hewlett Packard Labs. I could meet the team that was designing the PA Risk. Uh, architecture, the semiconductor process it went in, how those semiconductors were soldered down to printed circuit boards, and above that, operating systems, libraries, middleware, and the end it displayed on an HP terminal, printed off on an HP uh, printer or, or was stored to an HP disk drive. And that meant that technology and technologists were, were permeable. They went from labs to our development teams, labs to our manufacturing teams, labs to our service and support teams globally. Um, but as we grew bigger, as, as the IT industry became part of a global supply chain, um, it became more complicated to, to take research and development from somewhere like labs and then get it into one of our business groups because it might have to go out to an open source development team. It might have to go out to, uh, to a software partner. It might have to go out to a semiconductor partner and then be re, uh, re um reabsorbed into uh, HP and then Hewlett Packard Enterprise products. So I came to labs after 25 years of developing uh, to, to, to figure a way to sit in between, to take research uh, and basic and applied research, and then figure out how can we demonstrate at scale uh, that not that a technology is complete, but that it has real potential, realizable potential. So uh, what is it? going to take to integrate it? What is it going to take to industrialize it? What is it going to take to commercialize a technology? And so I would pull the researchers closer to this uncomfortable little space. At the same time, I would draft my colleagues from the business groups. I would pull them, engineers, product development team uh, members, uh, uh, leadership team, and pull them also into this uncomfortable middle space and begin to demonstrate. And especially as, as this is now a global uh, development economy, it's also meaning how do I find those academic teams? How do I find those open source development teams? How do I find those software hardware partners and also bring them together? So how do we convene on a set of promising technologies, find uh, not only the innovations and the ingenuity of the individuals contributing, but also what are those opportunities? What are those problems that need to be solved? What is unaddressed, uh, underaddressed, unsustainable on conventional technology? And then see, can I find that intersection point? Can I find that point where these new technologies and these really challenging problems might meet? And then the last piece is then figuring out, okay, who's going to pay for this? How do we work together to then solve the problems, to fund the, the applied development, and then begin the process of creating a new, vibrant, commercial, competitive marketplace out of these basic technologies, which uh, well, for the conversation that we uh, are having is where right where we find quantum. Uh, that we're on this precipice that's been promised here and we've been working towards it for uh, the better part, or actually pretty much that whole time that I've been working here, you know, for the last 30 years, it has been, you know, a promising technology. Thank you, Professor Feynman, for pointing us in this direction back in the 80s. Uh, and we finally are starting to see that potential come together. But at the same time, we have to know, we have to know what is it going to take to realize this potential? Uh, and so that's where I think uh, the kind of work that I've been doing at labs uh, is puts me in a, in a unique perspective because I am not a quantum physicist. Uh, I am an electrical engineer. Uh, and uh, But 
I really have had great experiences pulling these things together, convening uh, groups to prove out uh, that technologies are more capable of fulfilling that promise. So that's where I get to spend uh, my day job. So in 1989, I'm sure quantum mechanics and quantum physics was a thing at university. Yep. But was it an idea that was translating to industry at that point? Well, certainly. Um, so I, I had two courses. Uh, I had my, at the time it was called modern physics. Uh, and the funny thing was at Santa Clara University, my modern physics lab instructor, uh, Father Hain, had been a uh, my father's <laughs> modern physics instructor uh, in 1959. Uh, so you know, is, this is uh, this some continuity you have when you attend your 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 dad's uh, alma mater. Uh, but still, uh, we so we learned we learned you know, we learned Schrodinger's equation. We learned the basics. Now, what we were really learning that was for, to prevent prepare us for that second class, which was our class in semiconductor physics. Right. So. Absolutely. Quantum mechanical behavior was intimate into understanding how we are going to be successful engineers uh, who, even if you weren't going to be designing the semiconductors, uh, if you're just going to be like me and using, using, uh, you know, using the chips that came out of the process, you still had to be familiar. So yes, we use quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical behavior to des describe uh, semiconductor physics, and then we would build upon that. So we all had a level of um, of understanding, you know, we all built our gumdrop and toothpick uh, uh, crystal structures in in uh, semiconductor physics class. And you turn it around, and you say, okay, well, you know, this is how this is how it's going to work, and how the electrons are going to flow, how the flow holes are going to flow. This is why this material with this dopant is going to behave this way. You begin to understand, and, and absolutely, it takes a, a basis, but to harness quantum mechanics in order to compute or to harness quantum mechanics in order to create a sensor, you know, that was not, um, that was not on our agenda, uh, on our syllabus uh, at school. And really, I think that has really what has taken off in that intervening time is not only to, uh, to understand the quantum mechanical behavior of systems like solid state physics in order to create really amazing technologies, uh, but to begin to use this uh, as Professor Feynman instructed, uh, to use this when we need to have a more intimate understanding of the quantum mechanical systems. And then uh, that's when we need to, to have something that has quantum mechanical pro properties that not we're not just observing and controlling in to some degree that we really can to simulate, to get inside of the quantum mechanical system, to really understand how we engineer uh, those systems. And then when we add on top of that, you know, uh, Professor Shore's work on uh, cryptography and that first amazing insight uh, that a number theory challenge that is as old as mathematic primes factoring suddenly would become uh, something that is amenable, that Shor's algorithm on uh, factoring large integers, the basis of all of our public key cryptography. Thank you, quantum quantum, what is it, quantum Fourier transform. Uh, the ability to find a period in a function. Suantly, this was lurking inside um, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics and quantum computing as well. So it was that next real big insight that this isn't just for people who need to understand quantum mechanical systems who are physical chemists who are material scientists who might be doing something like um, drug discovery or designing the next great battery technology or uh, photonic uh, photovoltaic cell suddenly it's also people who are interested in basic numeric algorithms uh, you know, the the science uh, uh, the mathematics of um, of uh, integers that's another breakthrough. So yeah, those weren't on the radar. Those weren't on the syllabus back in 1989, but they have now come to the forefront, understanding beyond just the quantum mechanics, where else will uh, this kind of technology, this capability to compute in this completely different way, where will it find purchase? Now, excuse this next question, because um, your involvement in quantum computing is so high level. Um, but the other day I was talking to someone um, who works in factual TV and that person had never heard of the word quantum. 
And yet I feel that we are in an era where we need to know what quantum computing is about. Um, first part of my question is, are we actually using quantum computers yet? And um, if so, or if not, why is it important that we start to get familiar with what quantum computing is? Uh, so, you know, I think in general, we have, your friend is not alone. Uh, the, I, every night I do uh, the New York Times crosswords. Uh, and uh, last week, Qubit uh, was one of the words. And uh, I read uh, a very snarky, uh, beloved uh, uh, New York Times crossword blog, um, Rex, Par Rex Parker's blog. And, and he was like, what is this thing? What is this? Because he couldn't get it. Uh, you know, he had to get all the crosses in order he could see it. And then he thinks, what is a qubit? And then people would, would tell him, oh, it's a quantum bit. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we are at that point where some of us might, it might be in the vernacular for, for a lot of people, uh, but for others, it's just, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, it is important for us to understand these emerging technologies. Uh, and in the same way, it's important for people to know what the two letters in AI stand for. Um, we're already seeing AI technologies, the fact that uh, we can speak into our phones uh, in one language and have the phone speak back to someone else in their language. You know, that's pure science fiction stuff. And it's been made possible because of artificial intelligence uh, technologies, machine learning technologies. So AI, ML, uh, these, these, uh, these short two letter acronyms that we all toss about, um, they're material now to, uh, to the lives of uh, billions of people. Uh, we look at something like quantum uh, computing technologies. And because of the areas where it will likely find first advantage um, in designing systems with quantum mechanical properties that we need to harness, because we need better battery technologies, we need uh, better photovoltaic efficiencies in the cells. Wouldn't it be great if the uh, photovoltaic panels on the on the on my roof were as efficient in capturing and turning light into energy that we can harness as the plant that's sitting on my my table over here? Uh, that would be fantastic. We can think of all the challenges we have right now, um, or if it's something about you know about planning. Wouldn't it be great if we could? look at a complex uh, economy and say, okay, here's how we can make the best possible assignment of resources to the greatest need. The utilitarian economist's dream is the ability to compute that utility transparently so everyone can say, okay, I agree, this is the best course of action. You know, we're all going to opt in. You know, we're not going to have anyone who holds back. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. Um, you know, I need to see the research myself. You know, that ability to, to tackle an incredibly complex logistics problem. So all of these are the kinds of applications where we are anticipating potential quantum advantage. And so you don't have to know how it works. Um, you do have to understand why it will be so meaningful to so many people. And I think when we're, we're talking about a technology like this, and frankly, also because we're investing quite a lot of money. And whether that is pro, uh, public money uh, in terms of national uh, research programs, whether that is private money uh, that we have people putting their you know, re retirement 401k and the equivalent dollars into uh, as they are funding this research, uh, public and private, uh, they need to understand you know, what is that potential? What is the potential payoff for this? You know, should my nation have a national quantum uh, strategic plan? You know, right now, we just came from the World Economic Forum Global Technology Retreat, and the answer we all came was, yeah, you should probably have a plan. You should probably be thinking about what is it like in the future uh, if and when this technology really takes off. Uh, also, the National Institute of Standards here in the U.S. just released their first four candidate algorithms for cryptography that should be safe even if uh, we get quantum computing at scale. Uh, and so you know, pretty soon, that's going to be something that's going to affect you. You may not know it, uh, uh, until you know the, uh, something is a little bit more expensive because someone has now had to replace all of our cryptography with new quantum safe cryptography. So it will have a material effect on us in one way or another. And that's why I think as general participants in a technology-driven economy, and that's really what the whole world is now, 
um, it's really, uh, it puts us in a better position to make decisions, uh, both individual, local, regional, national, global decisions, when we are better informed, not necessarily about the low level of the technology, but what is its import and how should I, as a responsible participant in a democracy, understand these technologies well enough to make informed decisions. You know, it's my understanding that quantum computers would be best applied to answering the questions that have um, multiple factors. You know, it's not a sort of yes, no binary question. It's a question that just has, you know, so many influences, whether that's a question about weather or what's happening in our brains or cancer or vaccines, you know, just things that have so many um, parts to it, essentially. Is that a fair um, assumption? Well, there's, there's, there's elements there that, that are really important to pull out about quantum. Uh, and the, the way I usually describe it to my kids when they, when they say, well, what is this? Uh, I said, well, imagine you had, uh, I gave you a coin. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't tell you anything about the coin. Um, if you were to sit there and start flipping the coin, pretty soon you'd, you'd, be, you'd detect the pattern, right? Well, if I flip this coin 100 times, uh, maybe it comes up heads 50 times and tails 50 times. Okay, well, then I, I know uh, how this coin behaves. Even if it, became, if it flipped up and it was 10 times heads and 90 times tails, you know, okay, well, you didn't give me a fair coin, uh, but at least I know about it. Now, imagine that coin was a magic coin, and you could change that probability uh, uh, by, 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 by telling the coin, whispering the coin. Remember the magic eight ball? You'd shake up this thing, and then a little little cube would bubble out of the blue, and it would give you the answer to your question. It's like, yes, no, maybe, all those things. Well, imagine it's kind of like that. Uh, so I can influence this coin. Uh, and, and now, in the end, though, when I flip it, I always get an answer, heads or tails. I only get one bit. And that's one thing to remember when we're talking about qubits and their ability to, to uh, you know, hold massive amounts of information in, their, in how they interact with each other. In the end, when I'm done, every qubit only gives me one head or tail, yes or no binary answer. So if I have 50 qubits, people say, well, that can store 50 petabits of information. It's like, yeah, if I was to record all the nuances, all the, the back and forth of this complex quantum system, it would take a tremendous amount of, of, of information to represent that in a conventional computer. But in the end, when I'm done, all I have is 50 yes or no's. Now, even one yes or no uh, can be incredibly important. Should I get married? Should I make in this investment? Yes or no? Uh, and so, yeah, you, if you ask the right question, yes or no is an incredibly powerful answer. Uh, but it's all in how you create that question. So back to our magic coins. Uh, now imagine I had these magic coins. And in addition to me being able to influence them, they could all influence each other. And so if I had a pile of these magic coins and I begin to describe my problem to them, I'm influencing them, uh, they're influencing each other, and they're all changing their probabilities. And that's, that's when we say we have a, a quantum system that is coherent, that I've created this, and they're all influencing each other. And that's really the, the way in which we create quantum computing is we create a problem in which we describe the problem to the quantum computer. All of those back and forth influencing each other settles all those individual probabilities. And then in the end, I measure them all. I, I do my final measurement and heads or tails, yes or no, every qubit then settles into one value or the other. Uh, and then I look at those, and that's that's my that's the output of my quantum uh, computing experiment. Now we have to be careful, though, because just like a real coin, uh, even if it's if it's ninety nine to one heads to tails, uh, that it's going to flip. I'm going to flip it ninety nine times out of a hundred. It's going to be uh, heads, and one time out of a hundred going to be tails. I can still flip it on any one flip. It could still end up tails. Uh, so there is that probabilistic nature. And that's why often uh, we'll get a, when we use quantum computing, we get the answer. And if we're lucky, our problem is something like factoring in a number. It's very far, very hard to factor a number. It's very easy and cheap to multiply factors together and see, did you get the right answer? So that checking of it. Now, if we're saying, I'm going to use my quantum computer to, uh, to figure out the best way to send my fleet of trucks out 
Well, I actually can't check that answer. So what I, I might do is run it a couple times. I might say, okay, well, what is the average answer? And then I'll, 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 I'll get, get that. So that's the other thing to think about these quantum computing systems. Yes, you, if you're lucky, uh, you, if you're really lucky, then you can describe a problem very, with very little information, the quantum system interacting, interfering, adjusting all of those probability odds um, does all of the real work and then you measure the results at the end and you, then you get your, your yes, no answers out. Now, part of the challenge we have with quantum is we don't really know for a lot of these problems exactly how much information we have to provide in order to create the, the, the quantum um, computing program, but our, our quotes obviously program, because really we're talking about a physics experiment. We don't really know exactly how much information we have to put in. You know, I don't know the last time you tried to, to upload a, a big file to the cloud. You know, it might take days, right? I'm, I'm backing up some home systems right now, and I'm about four days into to backing up, uh, you know, a couple hundred gigabytes of data. Uh, if these quantum systems could represent not just gigabytes, petabytes, uh, exabytes of data, well, we actually have to then move exabytes of data into the quantum system and hope that you know, that it comes up with the right answer. So part of understanding when quantum will have an advantage is understanding for the kind of problem I want to do, how much time and energy does it take to set up the quantum system, to run the quantum experiment, to get the answer back, and then potentially do it more than once in order to, to have confidence in the answer. And so all of these make quantum just so different than we think about computing and classical computing. Uh, in classical computing, I have a disk drive. I, I can store my program off. I can uh, I have designed it with error correction. So chances are it's always going to come up with the exact same answer. We, we just have that, that model. Well, if I run it through the computer twice, of course I'm going to get the same answer unless something breaks, if the, unless there's a fault. And, and the engineers have already designed it so that it'll tell me if there was a fault and it'll check things and we'll have error correction codes and all these things. All this is new for quantum. And even at even if it all works the way it was intended, that probabilistic nature means that we'll always have to check the results. We'll always have to understand, I know you gave me this answer. Now I have to figure out, is it right? Or was I unlucky? We used to only think about luck factoring into uh, a calculation that we do. Uh, but now because of this probabilistic nature, which is part of the reason it works at all, uh, we have to accept that you know, this is different. So back to the question of when we need to understand, uh, you and I, the citizens, need to understand this, uh, we might have to, to dust off not just our normal uh, computing and, and mathematics, but, you know, I don't know if you took props and probability and statistics in school, uh, but, you know, not everyone does. And if this now becomes a fundamental piece of understanding how this kind of computing works, uh, then that might be something we want to put on more high school, uh, high school curriculum uh, so that people really are, again, Armed with the armed with the capability of understanding and participating meaningfully in a in a quantum technology driven economy. Wow, I found probability and statistics the most scary part of maths. I was more of a mechanics girl, um, but it's fascinating talking about the error correction because if there's one thing I've picked up um, about quantum computing. It's that there's a race currently going on to develop as many qubits as possible. Mm -hmm. And I hear various numbers of like, we've achieved 4,000 qubits or five qubits or whatever it is, and we're going to need a billion qubits. And, 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 and it's always teamed with this kind of notion that many of the qubits will be used to correct, to error correct. Um, and it just, you know, that's when I think people, I start to get lost because it's like, I just can't picture what it's going to look like in its physicality. I can understand gates, yeah, on zeros on off, but the qubits, like, is there a little ion moving around a qubit? So it, it, there are many ways to, you know, 
everything has quantum mechanical properties. Uh, usually the things that we run to on, run into on a day-to-day -day basis are too big. There's too many particles. And we only see the, 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 the large scale behavior of, of the table I, my computer's resting on, even the semiconductors inside my computer. You know, we, we talk about these bulk properties. When we use the quantum mechanic, uh, quantum mechanical behavior system, there's two things we have to worry about. One is uh, we have to get down to something that's small enough and, uh, and second, isolated enough that the quantum mechanical behaviors of, uh, of an individual system can be controlled, manipulated, and most importantly, measured. Because when I measure the quantum mechanical behavior, that's when I get my yes or no answer out of this, out of this system of qubits. And the power of quantum mechanics is that I can take two of these things with these properties, and if I put them together, then they behave as one. And that's that, that, that power of doubling. Two qubits you know, uh, hold twice as much capability as one. Four, uh, three qubits hold eight times as much. You know, and so we get that two to the n power. That's where the exponential increase in power. But back to our, our analogy of magic coins, in the same way I want to influence those coins and they want to influence each other, well, the whole rest of the universe wants to influence these things. And qubits are exquisitely sensitive, which is why um, they might make fantastic sensors uh, for sensing you know, just minute changes in the world. And that quantum sensing technology is, is that's for another day, but also fascinating technology. But so I have to basically, I have to isolate my little set of, of qubits from the entire universe and, and only I need to be able to influence these guys. Um, but the, the challenge is that uh, the rest of the universe wants to screw, wants to, wants to mess up the, my calculation, inject what we would call noise into the system. Uh, and so I have, to, I have to do things like I have to put it inside a vat of liquid helium uh, at temperatures that are much, much colder, colder than deep space because any amount of heat will destroy the system. Any stray radio wave coming in will destroy the system. And there are about a half a dozen different kinds of, of physical systems that people are exploring. Some are based on photons, some are based on ions. Can I take this little charged, uh, this atom where I've stripped off one or more electrons, can I hold it in space in magnetic fields and, and stick some other uh, ions next to it and have them all interact and, and zap them with just the right laser pulses in order to adjust and make them behave the way to input my data, then have them all evolve as they're all influencing each other. And then I read out all that information. I read out my yes or no's out of however many qubits I have. Um, there are some that are based on neutral atoms. There are some that are based on semiconductor technology. Uh, uh, the ones we think of, and you think those beautiful, um, those beautiful chandeliers, right? Well, that all gets bathed in that liquid helium because they're superconducting. They use the the power of superconduct superconducting systems in order to create these quantum states. There are lots of physical systems that we have, and uh, to your point about um, error correction. There's a, there's a line in Tolstoy, uh, all happy families are identical and all unhappy families are unique in their unhappiness. And we can say the thing, same thing about qubits. If we had perfect qubits that did only exactly what we told them to, that could ignore the rest of the universe uh, and could only interact with the qubits that we tell them to interact, that's a perfect qubit. That's an ideal qubit. And if we had 50 of those, uh, yeah, we would be changing the way that we do things uh, on an everyday basis, but we don't have those. We have a couple hundred uh, to maybe a thousand, and we're talking globally. Um, what we would say are the the nice term is noisy intermediate scale qubits, NISC qubits. Uh, the other way is just say they're crappy, right? Yeah, yeah. they uh, they are easily interfered with. Uh, they're very hard to get to do what we want. Um, you know, they we they're very expensive for us to maintain, and even if they are left alone, they will spontaneously break. And sometimes, in you know, some kinds, depending on which kind of qubit you have, it might last uh, a microsecond. Uh, it might last a couple seconds. You know, it just depends. But the other thing we have to think about all these different kinds of qubits everyone is is working on is they also are all different in other ways. It might be they might be really fast. You might be able to to affect the qubit in in uh, picoseconds or nanoseconds, billionths of a second. And if you can do something in a billionth of a second and it lasts for 
uh, you know, a thousand times longer than that, well, I can do a thousand different things in that time before it spontaneously breaks. Others, they might say, well, my qubit lasts for, for 10 seconds. And you're like, that's great. But if it takes you a second to do each of the little manipulations of your qubit, well, then you're only going to do 10 things before the thing spontaneously breaks. And as you add more and more qubits, you know, they, they break easier and easier. It's harder and harder to corral them, keep them safe, isolated from the rest of the universe and doing what you want. And so that's where, that's where we want to understand error correction. Can I use more of these crappy qubits uh, to do uh, to do a more complicated pro program? Now, you know, if the computers that we're looking at right now in front of us, um, they might do they do error correction, but they might add in one extra bit for every 64 bits. It's pretty cheap. Um, when we're talking about error correction in qubits, the the current projections and we don't know this for sure. It might take 10,000 qubits to equal one logical qubit. It might take 100,000. We don't know. Uh, and so that's a pretty big difference. If you're thinking about error correction and adding one extra, paying one extra bit for every 64, that's one kind of error correction. If you're talking about 10,000 qubits to yield one good one, now you can see why people say, well, we need a billion. Well, we might need a billion to get 10,000 good ones and 10,000 good ones is what it might need, take uh, for us to do like one of these really interesting. Can I, can I figure out how plants, you know, turn nitrogen into, for, you know, uh, to, to food? Uh, can I figure out how to turn sunlight into electricity more efficiently? Can I crack, you know, a modern cryptography code? That might take something like the order of 10,000 logical qubits. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where, understanding error correction and what is it going to take and remember when i if i have if it takes a billion qubits then just think of all of that information i have to be able to pump into those billion qubits and back to the question of of doing that and it's hard enough to do that from your laptop up to the cloud imagine going from uh, outside a gigantic vat of liquid helium <laughs> to the inside where it's not just sending ones and zeros down today's over your today's ethernet it's figuring out how to take those ones and zeros turn them into microwave pulses or laser pulses uh to manipulate this complex physical system this quantum mechanical system and you can see that this is a tremendous engineering challenge just a physical engineering challenge and and so when we see those 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 curves from quantum hardware companies that go uh, i have five now then I'm going to get to 10, and then I'm going to be 100, and then I'm going to be 1,000, and then 10,000, and then we keep on going up. Every one of those is going to be a hard-fought, hard-pitched battle of, of engineering. Uh, and back to the question of, you know, what does it take to get there? Those are some of the questions that we want to help answer. You know, to Again, that ability to convene academics, industry, enterprise, government, public and private partnership, as these are fundamentally challenging problems of engineering and science coming together. Uh, but it's so promising that it is worth the conversation. Well, that's actually my question is like, you know, it's all sounds so fantastic in theory, but we seem such a long way away. So why are we even talking about applications at this point? I think it's because the applications um, are meaningful, and 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 again, this goes back to goes back to Professor Feynman. You know, why did he suggest quantum computation? Because we needed to, and we continue to need to understand the behavior of systems that exhibit quantum mechanical behavior. Uh, that is just so fundamental to understanding to to harness material science to harness matter uh, and energy down at that molecular level you know wouldn't it be great if we had a machine that we could flip a switch and it turned carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or methane in the atmosphere into something that was like a little well a little diamond wouldn't that be great you know co2 in oxygen out diamonds drop out the bottom, um, you know, manipulating and having that with, with energy we could afford uh, to have it be something that we can afford the energy going in. Well, that means if you understood, you know, the material science down to that, you know, down to that subatomic level, the realm of quantum mechanics, 
you might actually be able to design and engineer a system that does exactly that. Now, that is complete science fiction, but you, you will commonly hear, you know, carbon preci carbon's precipitator, um, you know, mentioned as one of the potential, you know, things that you could do if you had this capability. Again, we look at we look at the photosynthesis in plants and we see it's so efficient and it's so cheap that it literally sprouts out like weeds. In the weeds my garden do a better job of harnessing light from the sun than all of the engineered panels on my roof. Um, mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't it be great if we had systems that we engineered for purpose that could do the same thing? So Back to Professor Feynman, he pointed us in this direction because he believed in the ability of humans to utilize this capability if, if we move this into a, an engineering tool, if we had this ability to manipulate and understand, simulate, adjust, engineer systems on the quantum mechanical scale, then you know he saw great promise there, and, and I would agree. Uh, and so that's why. You, you, add, you add that first impetus, then we add in the fact that now we, we also believe that this can be applied to massive logistics problems, that this could be applied to machine learning, you know, uh, well, let's just say machine learning, but really, you know, general artificial intelligence problems. So tremendous capability there in both symbolic problems and quantum mechanical behavior problems. That's why people are so interested in the technology it has that that promise but you know we always have to be careful have to be cautious because you know yes if you had infinite funds uh double doubling down on every bet it will eventually you'll be you'll you'll win uh but you know that kind of a betting strategy only works if you have an infinitely deep pocket uh and also it only works if the the the, the casino also has infinite monies that they can put into it so that's not a that's not a realistic betting strategy. That's yeah. That's a that's not one that we can afford. Um, so we 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 want to be realistic. We don't want to be pessimistic. We want to be we don't want to be optimistic. We want to be realistic. What is it going to take? And as we look at the technology and the successes we've had so far, which are promising, um, as something becomes more promising, then it also should invite greater scrutiny, greater collaboration to say, okay, well, I see you got five qubits and I can see now you're going to have a hundred. Okay. Let's take the next step. Let's figure out if you could take a hundred and make it a thousand, if you could take a hundred and make it a hundred thousand, what are the ramifications? Can we work out the engineering around uh, so we can understand and we don't get to, we won't invest in realizing a hundred thousand qubits and then find, oh shoot, turns out we don't have enough energy uh, in order to run this system. Turns out uh, that we don't have enough of this rare earth material. Uh, we don't want to find out after the fact uh, that our technology has a, a limiter that we did not uh, understand, um, not because we couldn't understand it, but that we weren't having that part of the conversation yet. I've just had a thought. Um, because, you know, the space industry is kind of gathering speed. Mm -hmm. um, could we take quantum computing development to space seeing as you know everything needs to be super cooled and the conditions are better out there oh, but actually the conditions are way worse <laughs> well first uh, space space is not cold enough um, so you think you think the icy depths of space, uh, but no, space is several degrees Kelvin, uh, and we need things that are you know, millikelvin. Uh, you know, so if you know the difference between four and 0. 0.004, uh, you know, so literally thousands of times cool colder than than deep space. Uh, so that's how cold these things have to get. Uh, also, space is full of energetic particles, and you don't want to be. You know, you'd have to shield it. And so, yeah, it, I, I, but you know, I, I thought the same thing, and that's why I had to Google. I didn't even know what the temperature of space was, but that same thing occurred to me. It's like, well, why don't we just put these up there? Isn't there lots of free cooling in space? Uh, and it turns out, no it's not cold enough uh, oh, and it's not, there's too much radiation. So there's, it, there's yeah, that's, that is definitely a challenge, uh, but you're right. Uh, that's that, that you want to know is there, you know, the one thing a space does have is, uh, is microgravity. Uh, 
Uh, and so that was that perhaps, you know, if, if I'm having to isolate and, and take these, uh, these ions and trap them in a magnetic field uh, to keep them isolated. And part of what I'm, re I'm doing there is counteracting the effect of gravity, uh, I mean, which is, is still in effect, even though we're talking about a single atom. Uh, that was the only thing I could think of that was also there. But yeah. Space is not cool enough, uh, you know, to do a superconducting qubit, which which is mind-boggling to me because you always think of well, there's nothing colder than space, right? Well, turns out there is. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, the, we could go off on another episode on this subject, but you know, the fact that we have to cool things down on Earth when it's colder out in space, so less cooling involved. Anyway, let's not open that can of worms. Um, I just listening to you, I just I really hope that we get to see quantum computers working in our lifetimes. And I still just don't feel like, I just don't know. And, and that's part of the challenge. And part also, you know, part of what we're used to, right? In 1970, Gordon Moore took three points and he drew an exponential curve in between them. And he said, there's Moore's law. Uh, this is how semiconductors uh, are going to behave. Uh, and he defined the shape of the world. Right, uh, our modern world is described by that Moore's law curve. Every other year or so, uh, we get twice as many transistors in the same size piece of silicon. Uh, now, the interesting thing that most people, back to the, what people mo most people don't know, is most people don't know that the kind of scaling that Gordon described in the 70s uh, actually ended in 2005. Uh, because as we continue to shrink in his quote, we'll call it geometric scaling, you just make every transistor smaller in this dimension, in this dimension, and that's how you end up doubling uh, twice as many. And there are tremendous engineering problems that were solved in order to continue that. But if eventually you shrink down a transistor and you get to a problem that as you're shrinking it down, it's still made of atoms. And there was a point where we were going to shrink it down and uh, one of the features was going to be less than an atom wide. It's like, well, you either have an atom and you have the feature or you don't have an atom and you don't have the feature. So that's what we ran into in 2005. Now, globally, the community came together, um, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, academics, industry, enterprise, governments, they came together. They did about 20 years of research in 10 years and they, they created the second era of Moore's law scaling, equivalent scaling, uh, where you might think, well, this is, you hear things, this is 10 nanometer process, this is a five nanometer process. Well, things aren't actually shrinking anymore in the same way that they did back when, when Gordon first described it, but we can put them tighter together uh, and we can, we, can, we can make them uh, tall now. So we, they're not just all flat, they can actually bump up a little bit so we can pack them even tighter together. And that's why we say equivalent scaling. Uh, so we put our fingers up and say that. Um, so things are still, we're still getting twice as many transistors per, per square millimeter they're just not just shrinking the way that they used to. They're getting tighter packed together. And maybe, you know, the next is we'll sort of run out of that next era in a couple of years. And, but then we might stack them vertically, might, might put transistor over transistor and get 3D. Uh, so we'll continue to scale. But what we're used to with Moore's Law was predictability. You know, every other year, I was going to have twice as many transistors. Uh, and actually, in the first, for the, up to the 2005, they didn't just get smaller, which meant they were cheaper. Uh, they also got faster. And they use less power. That's a triple word score. That was fantastic. Uh, you know, since 2005, they have gotten a little bit faster. Uh, they continue to get cheaper, um, but they aren't. They are using the same amount of power. So the power part went away. Uh, so that's where we sort of hit a ceiling on on some elements of, of scaling. But still, if you were, you know, someone who was going to invest their career, like I did. You know, you actually had a pretty good understanding of what was going to be in your future. You could decide intelligently about where you wanted to invest your time and your talent and your career. If you were someone who was building a business, you could plot that out and you say, okay, well, I can see what I can do today. That means in 18 months, I think I can do this. In 18 more months, I think I can do this. And so whether that it was enterprise, industry, academics, government, we all had a pretty good idea of what the shape of the future was gonna be. So we can make reasoned investments. They aren't risk-free, but they're well thought out. With quantum, we're at this really interesting point where there is, there is progress and it's been punctuated by breakthroughs. And that makes it really hard because if we think of the improvement graph, one, it's not, not that beautiful, smooth, 
uh, curve that we that Gordon described uh, with semiconductors, it's it's this jagged one, and it boop 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 boop, and it keeps hopping around. And also, what's on the horizontal axis isn't time, right? That was the great thing about Moore's law is that it had it, we measured it in time and we measured it in in performance. And when you have both of those, and you're making an investment, and you're wondering when is my payback going to be? Well, yeah, whether you're an engineer or a financier, you can make a well-reasoned investment. When, when, when the horizontal axis in quantum isn't time, it's more about capability. When am I going to have five qubits and how good are they going to be? When am I going to have 100 and how good are they going to be? Um, we don't measure that in time. We measure that in sort of success. And so that makes it super hard to make those same kind of reasoned investments. I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, should I should I stay in academia? Should I go into industry? Uh, you know what is what is the best way that I can contribute? Well, if, when you can't measure this in time, but your career is measured in time, that's a lot harder to decide. If you're if you're making an investment, if you want to understand and invest in technology, and you want to know well when am I going to get my payoff? Well, you get your payoff when we get to a thousand good qubits. It's like, well, when am I going to make my? You told me how I'm going to make my payoff, but when am I going to make my payoff? And they say, well, when we're done. Uh, and that's a that's a lot harder. That's a lot more speculative. Um, that takes a little bit more of a gut check when you're writing those those uh, those venture capital checks, or when you're spending tax dollars on this thing so that's that's tougher and and i think that's part of the challenge we have with quantum how do we describe that horizontal axis we know the vertical axis high quality qubits and actually frankly even we, there we can't we don't have one way what's a good qubit well a good photonic qubit is going to be different than a good trapped ion qubit good different than a good neutral ion qubit so we don't have that one way to talk about even the vertical axis and then the horizontal axis measured by success and milestone rather than time make this a challenging investment to make. I feel like there are just so many things because um, even when you're talking about supercomputers, I felt like, you know, we're busting a myth right there, you know, because people think supercomputers must be quantum you know, they'll be coming soon. But I think what's really important about what HPE does is that they, you know, when I worked with you a couple of weeks ago, I really got a sense of the importance of integration. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a, a, a major intermediary step to this ambition of, of quantum computers, you know, solving everything. I think this step is fundamental for getting there. So. And you know, and even if we, if we think of the supercomputer, you know, it takes more energy. It take or it takes less energy. It takes less energy to to multiply two numbers together in in, in one of these supercomputer chips than it does for the data to go from one corner of the of the chip to the other. So that energy consequence of moving to even in the supercomputer day, the energy consequence of moving information around, even if it's only a couple of millimeters from one side of the chip to the other, that energy the energy consequence of, of data movement dominates the the overall effectiveness and energy uh, uh, energy profile of the supercomputer. It's not that we don't have enough floating point operations where we we are we're up to our eyeballs in in the ability to compute, but the ability to get data into and out of these systems, into and out of memories, that dominates it. And that's when we look at someone who says, "Well, yeah, you know, fifty qubits, you can store tremendous information." So yes, you could. However, you still have to move it. And so how do we pull all these pieces together? You know, that is the, that is, you know, so when you see the curves and say a oh, thousand qubits, and I think how many bits are you going to have to move? How many, how many classical floating point operations do you need to encode a single laser pulse that's going to make one of those qubits, you know, spin a quarter turn to the right and all, all of those things. So that engineering um, it's it's one thing to have a couple of them. It's one thing to manipulate them almost by hand, but what we need to have this be is automated because you know it, we think of a billion. And you th it seems like so many. We have ten qubits, but remember we used to deal with individual transistors, and yet you know this device has millions, hundreds of millions of transistors, and I pay almost nothing for each one. I expect them to work forever. There's almost no energy, so we can, as a species, accomplish 
fantastic feats of engineering. And so, yeah, I think there is promise. Now, what we're taking on is is more challenging in so many ways than than what it took to accomplish this kind of uh, this is you know this is science fiction this would have changed the course of history if it had been available even a hundred years uh earlier than it was uh and so you know that you know that is it is science fiction made real by engineering uh and uh, it is something that the global community you know is is trying to tackle uh, it is promising. It has potential, but there are real problems to be solved on uh, on an unprecedented scale. Yeah, uh, I think from having a conversation with you today, I've realised that there are so many myths to be busted, um, and you know, it's becoming very clear to me why this series is important because um, a couple of the things you've said today um, actually shine a light on um, a few things that the media skews. So for example, the race for the number of qubits, that is kind of, if you don't have the knowledge of the energy component of that, Mm -hmm or the error component of that, mm-hmm. just, just the various different um, aspects to the problem, um, you can't make an informed decision. And I, I can, you know, because they often say that quantum computing is a geopolitical issue. And and if, if it does get political for whatever reason, and people just don't know the actual facts, then um, it's quite scary. You know, and I, I hope that this series can really um, shed light on the actual important things to know about quantum computing. So, yeah, I need to hold on to that. Yeah, yeah, because you know, there's quantum computing is absolute catnip for science writers, right? It's got everything you want. The, the hardest problems we have to solve as a species, okay, checkbox. Uh, it's got spookiness. You can invoke Feynman and Einstein, uh, so check there. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's just tremendous this race on, you know, that the money is flowing into this. So who wouldn't want to talk about this? But, you know, what you mentioned, I, it, it, there is certainly a, a very real concern within the industry. What made semiconductors as powerful and successful as they were is that we establish international, cooperative, pre-competitive. So before anyone was making money, when people were just amazing money, we had a community of academics, industry, enterprise, government, and we all worked together. Then we can fiendishly compete uh, you know, in the open market once the technology has been proven and we make those investments to and then turn it into uh, into a very competitive field. Part of the concern, uh, especially because of harvest data now, decrypt data later by state and and state equivalent operators, uh, is there's the concern that you might see uh, this uh, information go under technology export control, that you will actually clamp down on uh, the pre-competitive international cooperative science and industrial cooperative environment, uh, because you're, you're going to see, you know, nationalized and say, okay, now this is, a, you know, you didn't even realize this, but, you know, your quantum research has now been declared, you know, a uh, export control, because it, you know, they're seeing it as a weapon. And that is a real concern that you'd have is that we will end up having either because of a national security uh, agency decides that this is information that cannot be shared, or maybe it's a venture capitalist who decides, you know, I don't want you to publish that next paper because this is RIP now. Uh, you know, will we see a chill on the cooperative environment in quantum? Uh, something that will shut down that. And and you know, again, that's what made semiconductors part of what made semiconductors successful. Part of the reason, the huge reason, we were able to switch out from the scaling that Gordon predicted to the scaling that was beyond that which Gordon predicted is that we had this ability to create globally, internationally, science, academia, industry, government. Um, it would be a shame if we saw the concerns about cyber security and cryptography freeze out that cooperative um, environment. But it, it you know, certainly is, it is a concern. Mm. 
Gosh, well, in the few minutes that we have um, left, um, what is your main focus at HPE Labs? You know, and I ask that because there are so many layers to the quantum computing story. Mm -hmm. um, like, what are the most pressing things that need to be addressed? And, and how are you addressing it, HPE Labs? Yeah, so uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and, and Hewlett Packard Labs, you know, right now we have just completed a big milestone of our own. We created the, the world's highest performing supercomputer. So that classical number cruncher that's going to power science and industry, a billion billion, an, exa, an exaflop, a billion billion operations per second, uh, as powerful as the next eight supercomputers combined in one system. Uh, and that gives us that sort of... Um, that, that uh, perspective on what comes next. And for us, it's understanding how we will not just continue to improve classical computing, how we'll begin to pull in quantum, neuromorphic, analog, all of these next generation heterogeneous is the term we'll use, uh, heterogeneous computing approaches, computing that is unlike conventional computing. But we realize that there isn't going to be just one computing style that will continue to take over. And, and frankly, what we're motivated here is that as we look at that Moore's law curve and we look at, at now coming into the end of the second law, second era of, of scaling and wondering, but not proven, will that third era, three-dimensional scaling, stacking transistors on top of each other, will that take off for compute? It has taken off for memories, uh, but that's an if, not a when in compute. So we need computers to continue to, to improve in performance. We desperately need computers to improve in efficiency in how many watts uh, of energy we put into computing to get the answers out. So we need more sustainable computing. We need more performant computing. And for us, that means we need more than one style. But how do we begin to integrate all of these computing technologies that are now so vastly different than the way we have traditionally done computing? I need to work them all together. I need to be able to have a scientist, an engineer, an artist describe their problem. I then have to figure out how to break that problem down. Oh, this piece, this should go on the, the, the classical uh, supercomputer. This piece is a great piece for quantum. This piece over here, this should go to our analog uh, inference engine. So how do we break a problem down, run it over all of these styles of computing, get the answer back and then say, here you go. Uh, and how do we make that accessible? How do we make sure that everyone who needs access to this next generation of computing can do so uh, without having to be both a genius geneticist and a fantastic, you know, multidisciplinary computer programmer? We don't want someone to have to understand their science, their art, their industry, their engineering, and also quantum mechanics and also uh, analog computation and also classical computation. So for us, is two questions. There's that, the first one is integration. How do we pull all these different styles of computing together when they are just so different from each other, but then make it look to you on in front of your screen as a way in which you can naturally express your problem of science engineering art and have the answer come back to you and have it be the sustainable performance that we need. And the second part is, and it sort of underlies that, is that industrialization. We have these very fascinating physics experiments that we call quantum computers today. How do we take those and then integrate those in and industrialize them? So it's one thing to be able to have a couple qubits uh, and it took you a year to set up the experiment to, to run one quantum comp computation. We need to have those be integrated in and scaled up so that we can have uh, 10,000, 100,000, a million, a billion of these qubits and solve all of the physics problems, solve all the engineering problems, and then have it integrated in. And also to understand what does it take in terms of energy, in terms of data flow, in terms of networking, cooling, all those basic physics problems that we understand so well in classical computing. How do we do that inside of quantum computing as well? Knowing that 
these are so different in their behavior, so demanding in terms of environment. For quantum computing to work, we have to take a small system, isolate it from the rest of the universe, be able to manipulate it um, carefully, let it do its thing, come back, open the box and pull out this fantastic answer. Well, that is, you know, just when you describe it like that, it seems like that's a, that's a fairly advanced bit of engineering. Uh, and really, so for that's, that's what we're interested in. Industrialization, integration, and how do we make it available? It's one thing to be very clever. It's another thing to be uh, meaningful. And for these technologies to be meaningful, they have to be accessible. They have to be sustainable. Uh, they have to be uh, something that we can equitably provide to the entire world. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to, to tackle. That's where we're bringing our knowledge of supercomputing, of traditional system building, our knowledge uh, and research as we've done done our own quantum computing uh, work. We About a decade ago, we had teams staring at, at, at uh, diamond lattice and injecting nitrogen atoms in there to create their, their qubits, yet another kind of qubit. Uh, and, uh, you know, that team walked away from that work 10 years ago because they didn't see that meaningful path to uh, customer impact. Uh, and so they switched over and they've been doing really interesting work on photonic com uh, communication and computation. They're coming full circle now. Uh, and understanding uh, how their research could be applied uh, to some of the same problems uh, uh, that we look at the quantum systems of, but using classical physics instead. So quantum inspired is another area of research here at, at Hewlett Packard Lab. So overall, how do we pull these things together? How do we prepare ourselves for success? If we imagine we had a billion qubits, let's look back from that imagined success and see what else did we have to clear out of the way so that those billion qubits could live up to the potential that we imagine that they have. And let's be able to get there so that everything else around those billion qubits is ready when they are. I'm hopeful. Because <laughs> I must say, listening to the complexity i'm just like i'm 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 never going to see a quantum computer working but after this idea of integration and also industrialization so therefore you know prov providing an actual need for this type of computation um i can see you know that the race is on to find the solution um so it feels hopeful that okay, we won't, we may not necessarily have like a standalone quantum computer, but we will have a supercomputer, which I think sometimes people confuse a supercomputer being a quantum computer. No, uh, a supercomputer is a classical computer that's doing much more complex things than um, they were traditionally built for by integrating. Com components of quantum and quantum ideas and 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 I love this idea of going 3D and you know so it's exciting the future of uh, quantum computing and just computing in general is really exciting um, I feel like I could talk to you for hours more um, and there's probably hours and hours of things to discuss but in terms of just um, skimming the surface thank you so much for providing the insights and the analogies, I think that's so important when it comes to quantum. And um, hopefully we can do this again sometime, but thank you so much for this initial chat. Happy to do it. <laughs>